I'd like to welcome you all to another one of our lectures by the distinguished faculty, distinguished professors of the university. The retired faculty association has been running these for the last year and a half. So this is the 18th or 19th talk uh, by uh, one of our professors who, with whom, for, for whom we have a great deal of respect. Uh, to, to this afternoon, we have two distinguished professors in the group. Uh, and the unusual aspect of that is they are married to each other. Last month, you heard Marjorie McIntosh uh, from history. And tonight we're having Dick McIntosh from MCDB. As I mentioned to them, it's a good thing that they, the two of them are in different fields or that would have made dinners more interesting or difficult. So Dick McIntosh, uh, received his bachelor's in physics from Harvard in 1961. Um, and after, I understand, a couple of years of teaching high school physics, he uh, returned to Harvard uh, to get his PhD in biophysics. Uh, he came to Boulder in 1970 um, and uh, began teaching in M the Department of Molecular Cellular Cellular and Developmental Biology, first as an assistant professor, then he became an associate professor, then as a professor and eventually chair of the department. He, um, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1999. And a year later, he was appointed as a distinguished professor at the University of Colorado. He retired in 2007, but as he, as he describes it, thanks to the support of the National Institute of Health and the hospitality of MCDB, he has con continued his research in mitosis, about which we will hear a little bit this afternoon. So I give you uh, Richard McIntosh to speak on... <laughs> we'll surprise people. There we go, the cell biology of cancer progression. Okay. Thanks for that kind introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about a subject which I find very interesting, the biology of cancer. Cancer is a dark subject, and many of us in this room know just how dark it can be. But this talk is not about cancer medicine or the difficulties that come from both financial and medical problems. It is instead about the nature of cells, human cells, and how they can change uh, leading to the emergence of cancer as a really natural phenomenon, and indeed, indeed uh, unfortunately common. Um, I'd like to add that this talk is not for specialists. I'm not going to present any novel information, and I've tried to make it as comprehensible as I can for the general audience. Cancer is a disease of cells. It's caused by cells that lose their control and misbehave. To understand cancer, then we need to know something about cells, what they are, how they work when they're doing things right. So I will start describing that and then describe how things can go wrong and the consequences of these errors that the cells make leading to a disease that we now know is a serious one. Our bodies make more than 200 different kinds of cells, many, many of some of those cells, so that our body really is filled with cells and the things that cells make, like the plasma of blood or the solid material of bone. Cells are tremendously diverse, and in this slide you see Three examples over on the left is liver, and each of these little objects, like the one that I've circled in the upper left, is a single cell. They form a tissue which is specialized to be able to govern the chemistry of blood, and it does that job very well. On the other hand, here is an image of blood in which these faint objects in the background are the familiar red blood cells. And here are four different kinds of white blood cells looking somewhat different, but each of them highly specialized to achieve some function in protecting your body against infection. 
On the other end over here is a single neuron, a nerve cell with the nerve cell body and the nucleus and these very extensions which reach out and make connections with other cells. And the complexity that's seen in these structures is one of the reasons that our capacities for thought and behavior are so complex. So cell variety is extreme. Fortunately, there are, however, some features of cells which are common to almost every cell. And in this light micrograph at a higher magnification, I draw my pointer around a single cell here, which contains a nucleus stained blue with a dye that binds specifically to DNA. This is the repository of the information. Marjorie? Your pointer is not showing. Oh my goodness me. Thank you for telling me. It looks beautiful here. Um, so um, I wonder if it's a pointer. Um, I'll try to do it with words. How remarkable that it doesn't show. Um, but there it is. Um, the blue circles are nuclei, and they contain DNA as well as some other things. DNA is a remarkable molecule because in a code written along its length is information on how to build a new cell. And we'll come back to that point several times in the course of the talk. In the background around that circle is a region of the cell called the cytoplasm. And in this particular cell, where certain things have been stained, other things not, the green is staining fibers which are made of proteins that are quite similar to muscle. And these fibers help to give the cell its shape and help to contract and when the cell needs to move. The orange is staining an organelle called the mitochondria, which is involved in metabolizing food that the cell takes in and turning it into useful things for the cell. Back in the whole cell is a membrane. And the membrane is not visible in this micrograph. But if I bring in an electron micrograph here in the upper corner, the extracellular space and the intracellular space are distinguished by that pair of lines running roughly horizontally. That pair of lines is something upon which the vitality of the cell resides because it's almost impermeable to almost all molecules. And this is terribly important because inside the membrane, there are thousands of different molecules that are essential for the way in which cells will have chemical reactions going on. If the membrane were not impermeable, they would leak out and this would lead to the death of the cell. So the membrane is impermeable, but were it simply a wall, the cell would have no way to feed. So it is semi-impermeable and it can allow in sugar molecules and other kinds of nutrients, which the cell will then use in order to metabolize, to grow and be able to perform its functions. That membrane has an additional function, which is very important for the body of your cancer because the outer surface of the membrane exposes several kinds of molecules which work like antennas. They are able to bind molecules floating around in the extracellular space, respond to the binding, and give instructions to the interior of the cell. And this idea will be fundamental to what I'm going to be saying about cancer and how it develops. The orange objects, those things that I refer to as involved in metabolism, are called mitochondria, shown in electron micrograph here. And the specialized membranes in this uh, organelle are involved in taking the energy which is in sugars and converting it into a kind of fuel that cells use to drive most of their energy requiring processes. That molecule is called ATP, which are the initials of adenosine triphosphate. A, a molecule whose triphosphate, the three phosphates, will be important to us in several ways. And, and ATP is the fuel that cells use both to drive metabolism and make things like macromolecules and also to move and to move ions around so that they can govern the internal environment. Now, cells alive are, of course, in action. And so these static images fail to reflect that. But I can now show a movie in which these two cells, which were imaged in my lab about 50 years ago by a student who did a very nice job, was able to record the processes. There we go. In a time lapse series. And you just saw those two cells divide to make four. 
This is a significant time lapse. 30 seconds corresponds to a whole day. And every day, these cells have done enough of internal biosynthesis that they've made themselves into two cells within a single bag, and they can then divide in two. And each of those two cells has all the constituents it needs to be able to grow and divide again. When you watch one cell, you'll see that it's moving around and wiggling, but then it divides in two. The division process was visible to early microscopists, and so it was called the active stage of the cell, and the interval between divisions was called a resting phase. But we now know that that's a terrible misnomer, because during the inter space between the division periods, the cell is tremendously involved in metabolic activity, which of course don't, does not show up in the microscope. So I want you to think about these cells between divisions. You can see that the edges of the cells are roughening. This is a process in which they're taking in extracellular medium and they're using the nutrients that are in it in order to feed them to the mitochondria and make ATP, to take the constituents molecules like amino acids and turn them into proteins. So all of this growth is going on in order to make two cells in one bag. But one of the most significant events that occurs during interphase is the duplication of the DNA. Because if DNA is the instructions for making a cell, there must be two copies before the cell divides, otherwise one cell will go without. So DNA replication, so-called, is occurring during interphase in a key way. And I'll say more about that because it's central to our discussion of cancer. Now, Let's look for a moment with more detail at the actual division process, because it's really quite a remarkable event. Here at much higher magnification, using a microscope which colors objects or makes them dark on the basis of how much material is there. And the material of the chromosomes is dense enough that they show up as dark little sausages within the nucleus, which is the big oval that you see. Each of those little chromosomes is already duplicated. This cell has gone through the period of DNA replication, and it is now ready to divide. And when I run the movie, what you'll see is that the envelope which surrounds the nucleus will disperse, and a machine, which is not visible with these kinds of optics, will then engage the chromosomes and start to have an effect on their position. So at first, the chromosomes are really just moving by thermal energy. But then as the machine gets engaged, it starts to move the chromosomes towards a plane that runs across the cell. The chromosomes are big enough that they slop away from the plane. And you can see over on the right some chromosomes that are being acted on by this machine, which is called the mitotic spindle. And the mitotic spindle is trying to organize all the chromosomes, but some of the chromosomes are recalcitrant. When they're all in place, a signal is given, and the duplicate copies are pulled apart to segregate into two distinct sets of chromosomes, and therefore the instructions which will now allow each of the two cells that is forming from cleavage to make a nucleus that contains all the instructions to go ahead and divide again. I must say that is an amazing movie. So let's now abstract the cell cycle of growth and division. And in this picture, you can see the M phase, M for mitosis. This word comes from the Greek word for thread, because early microscopists saw the chromosomes as threads. Mitosis is a time when the chromosomes are organized and segregated. Cell division is when the cell pinches to form two, and interphase is all of the interval until the next round of division. The initial stage, G1, is a time of growth in which the chromosomes now uncoil and start to be expressing their genes in order to make the various things that go into the cell and make it work. But the, nothing is happening about DNA replication until an interval here where so-called S phase begins. This is in some sense the time of decision for a cell to divide because it's now beginning to make the duplicate copies of the DNA essential for division, and then followed by more growth, more synthesis in order to prepare the cell fully for the mitotic event, which is the mechanical separation of this cell that has become double into two distinct entities. 
This process of growth and division is under normal kinds of control when things are going right. And here you see an image of cells growing again in the laboratory. And on the left, these are normal cells, and they're displaying the phenomenon that in the region here where the cells have many near neighbors, they've stopped their division cycle. There would still be division going on at the edge where there are no cells on one side. This process is abrogated during cancer. Cancer cells do not know how to stop growing, and they'll pile it on top of one another. They grow without this phenomenon of contact inhibition of growth. Cancer cells lacking that are more prone to divide and make too many copies of themselves. And this is an example of the kind of misbehavior I was alluding to both in the title and in the introduction of the talk. How can this happen? I'm now going to show a movie in which this cell, an epidermal cell, is expressing a protein involved in cell cell adhesion. And that protein has been stained green with a special dye. The whole cell is green because the protein is everywhere. But you can see at the junctions between cells, this protein accumulates because it's involved in forming junctions. They are mechanical, but they are also informative because a signal comes from the surface of the cell where the junctions have been made and goes to the cell center. And it says, don't start S phase, don't start DNA replication because we have enough, we're all there. This is an example of a negative control on the cell cycle. So if we now look at our diagram of the cell cycle, we can see that we're coming along here, but at some stage, the environment is not favorable, contact inhibition says to stop. There are other negative controls on the cell cycle, which are very important. For example, a cell can assess how big it is. Is it big enough? Does it have enough material to be able to grow and develop? Is there damage to the DNA? Because that would be very dangerous to go forward and divide if the cell carried mistaken information. Has all the DNA replicated? Because if you initiated division before replication were complete, you could imagine a genetic disaster. And when we get into mitosis, are all the chromosomes attached? And you may remember that most of the chromosomes were roughly in the middle of the cell, but there were a few little fabrics who weren't there, and the separation did not start until they were all there. So the negative controls were blocking progression of mitosis until all of the chromosomes had reached the proper place. These are examples of negative controls on the cell cycle. But there are also growth factors. Growth factors are proteins that stimulate the cell to go into division. You remember I mentioned when I discussed the cell membrane, that there were molecules on the surface of the cell that worked like antennas. These antennas are picking up the fact that growth factors are in the environment, giving the instruction to divide. So we have positive effectors and negative effectors. We can define two kinds of control on normal growth and division. Both of these fail in cancer. The checkpoints assess environment and the quality of preparations for division. For example, is DNA replication complete? Are all the chromosomes on the spindle? If things aren't right, the delay is going on. Growth factors tell a cell to initiate DNA synthesis. For example, if you need more blood cells, then growth factors would stimulate the cells in your bone marrow that are involved in producing new cells to bring your hematocrit up. Both of these kinds of controls are important in cancer because a cell can lose the stimulatory effect of growth. Uh, can, can behave as if stimulated when it is not, and it also can lose the negative controls that are preventing it from going on. And we're going to see how those changes can occur. So let's dig in a little more deeply and see if we can understand cancer by being more specific. And what I'm now going to talk about first is growth factors and how they work. This little pink object is an example of a growth factor, epidermal growth factor, or EGF. Here shown as a little pink blob is a small protein. It's made by several cell types, and it circulates in the blood. 
So many cells are exposed to epidermal growth factor, but only those cells that have a receptor for this factor are in a position to respond to it. And this is called the epidermal growth factor receptor. It is another protein, and it is protein three parts with an external domain, a membrane crossing domain, and a cytoplasmic domain. That is one that's inside the membrane. So the epidermal growth factor can bind the epidermal growth factor, and the receptor receiving its growth factor will stimulate that cell to divide. Notice that this means that if you don't have the epidermal growth factor, you won't divide, but if you don't have the receptor, you won't divide either. It's the conversation between those two molecules that leads to stimulation. This little movie is uh, a little hokey, but it shows two examples of the receptor in the plasma membrane. And they're shown as moving around. And I say it's hokey because, of course, these molecules would be in thermal motion and they'd be vibrating around, moving quite rapidly. And they don't interact unless they both have epidermal growth factor bound to them. When they do, those extracellular domains stick to one another. They then hold the intracellular domains together. And you can see the little tails dangling. These shouldn't be violent thermal motion because that would be reality but they're shown instead in a graceful little embrace. And the significant thing is that each of the intracellular domains can modify the tail on the other one. So they change each other and develop a modification inside the cell as a result of the growth factor having bound to the outside of the cell. And this change is what can lead to the transmission of a signal into the cell. Now, I've been using the word protein and carrying on, and you all know protein as food, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about proteins because their nature is key to our understanding what's really going on here. So this is a bit of a digression, but an essential one. Proteins are big molecules that are made from a string of small ones called amino acids. This diagram on the left spring, and the green shows that every amino acid has a domain in common, which allows them to stick to one another like puppet beads. They just sort of make a little chain. The little objects that are sticking off colored different circles. Those reflect the fact that proteins are made from 20 different amino acids. And the significance about the difference is that the chemistry of each of these little side chains, as they're called, is distinct. Some of them, the ones that are labeled green here, are like fat. And fat is notoriously insoluble in water. Some of them are positively charged and some of them are negatively charged. And those are going to be soluble in water very much the way salt will dissolve in water. Others of them are like sugar. And sugar is very soluble in water. So the behavior of this chain is going to depend on which amino acids are there and their positions relative to one another. And the chain then, free in solution in the cell, will wiggle around in Brownian movement and rearrange itself to form a structure which has, as a physicist would say, the minimum energy. That is to say, it's going to put all of the water insoluble parts in the middle and the water soluble parts around the outside. This makes an object then that's stable in an aqueous solution. Further, if you imagine that you have both positive and negative charges, those attract, but positive charges repel positive charges and like, all like charges repel each other. So that the shape that the protein takes on is going to depend very specifically on where the different charged amino acids are, where the different fatty amino acids are, and how the protein folds will be defined by the composition and even the sequence of those amino acids. And when a protein folds, it forms a rather complex looking background molecule. In this diagram, each of the little pseudospheres is representing the position of one atom. And so this is a small protein that would contain only a few thousand atoms, but proteins can be huge. And we'll see several proteins that are quite big. The significant thing about a protein is the surface of its structure, because you can imagine that it's covered with charges and shape 
defined by the way the protein folded. And that is going to define what the protein will interact with and how it can affect other things in the cell. I'm going to give you an example now of a protein in action. This is a protein that's involved in the motion of chromosomes, which you saw in the second movie. Its name is kinesin. And the bottom of it here has two domains, each of which can bind a fuel molecule, ATP. And when ATP is bound, then the motor head is in a specific shape. The long strand is called the tail for obvious reasons. And up at the top is a domain which connects to cargo. And when this thing is in action, oops, that wasn't the right thing to do. Um, this is supposed to just run. Let's see if that'll make it go. Okay. This is the kind of motion that this motor can go through. A series of steps in which, with every step, it is using a molecule of fuel and repositioning itself along a periodic fiber, the microtubule, as it's called, which is part of the machinery that moves chromosomes. And you can see here, the microtubule is allowing the motion so it will pull at this point. It could also pull a chromosome. This is a motor which is defined in its speed and in the direction it moves. And it is also defined in what its cargo would be based on the shape of its cargo binding domain. A nice example of how tricky and active proteins can be in terms of serving as machines to do jobs in cells. So where do proteins come from? This is now all of the basic dogma of molecular biology in 30 seconds. What we have here is DNA as a double-stranded molecule, and each strand is made as a polymer of four molecules called nucleotides. And they're usually abbreviated just by their initial A, T, G, and C. And the significant thing about DNA structure is that the structure of the A sticking in here is such that it fits beautifully with T, but none of the others. And so here then is a T and an A. And wherever you have a T, you're going to have an A across it. And this complementarity, as it's called, is the essence of what makes double-stranded DNA a stable molecule that it is. From our point of view, we separate those two strands and then the information which is encoded by the sequence of the nucleotides along one strand can be copied out exactly in a messenger, a molecule of ribonucleic acid as opposed to deoxyribonucleic acid. This is RNA. And you see that all of these little prongs look like the prongs on the upper side, the so-called sense strand of the DNA, as opposed to the anti-sense strand. This is a message. The DNA is left behind as a storage device at the nucleus. The message then goes to the machinery which can translate this genetic code into an amino acid sequence. And that amino acid sequence will then define the way in which the protein will fold. Another key aspect of this, of course, is you've got to start reading in the right place and stop reading when you've read the full message. So there's punctuation along the DNA, and there is sequence here, which is involved in deciding where to start and when to start. And in this diagram, I'm emphasizing the when to start. That is, we've extended the DNA because in these upstream regions, which can extend from a long way, are sequences that define what will be able to bind to the DNA and turn on the expression of that gene. These things that bind to DNA and turn on gene expression are proteins. They're called transcription factors, if you care, because they're turning on the process of transcribing the DNA into RNA. And this region of control is key for defining when a particular stretch of DNA will be read out and converted into a protein sequence. The stretch of DNA that defines a protein is a gene. One kind of cancer, one kind of protein, is critically important for the emergence of cancer. And this may not be so familiar. It's called a protein kinase. And the term kinase refers to proteins that are going to be involved in taking a small negatively charged group of atoms and attaching them to the surface of something else. 
a protein kinase will make this attachment onto a protein. The little group is called a phosphate, and it is a phosphoric atom and four oxygens, which when it's in a water solution, carries two negative charges. A protein kinase can be diagrammed like this. Here's the protein kinase represented symbolically. Here's a protein that we're gonna change. And the protein kinase will bind to the protein and bind the molecule of ATP, where ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, and it will cut off the terminal phosphate, making it adenosine diphosphate, and attach that phosphate onto the protein. Now, as the significance of this, imagine that you have a distribution of charges that has made the protein stable in solution, and now you plug in two negative charges, the protein's gonna change its shape as a result of those negative charges pushing away other negative charges and pulling in other positive charges. So a phosphorylation event will change the structure of a protein just a little bit, but cells use this change to turn the action of a protein on or off. This is a significant aspect of how cells control things. And what we're interested in here is control. And it turns out many of the receptors for growth factors are protein kinases. So they are going to be able to work as kinases and attach phosphate to other proteins and in this way, modify what that protein can do. But the significant thing about the receptor protein kinases is they are only active as protein kinases when they are bound to their growth factor. So the growth factor is a switch that turns on the kinase, and the kinase is a switch that turns on proteins. And you remember we saw the receptor extended from outside the cell, where it can find the growth factor, through the membrane to the inside of the cell, where it can turn on intracellular activities. Protein kinases working as growth factor receptors can work like this in a very simplified diagram. A growth factor binds. It activates the interior and actually this activation is done because this is a protein kinase and it puts phosphates on the two parts as we saw in that little movie. This is now a different chain and it activates protein and the names don't matter here. It happens to be called RAS. It then activates another protein kinase, activates another protein kinase, activates another protein kinase. And ultimately, it goes in here and it activates something that is regulating the expression of a gene. And the gene that it's activating is called MIC. So I've left it with this real name. And so as a result of activating the expression of the MIC gene, MIC protein is made. And you would say, so what? Well, the so what is that the MIC protein is an inducer of the expression of other genes whose protein products turn on DNA synthesis. So the growth factor binds the receptor. The receptor becomes phosphorylated. It stimulates other protein kinases, which phosphorylate other protein kinases, which phosphorylate other protein kinases, which ultimately lead to the expression of a gene. And that gene turns on other genes. It's sort of like the house that Jack built. But it's this chain of information that is giving us the onset of DNA synthesis, the response to growth factor. This is important. And if you do it when you shouldn't be doing it, you're in trouble. So not surprisingly, there is a negative control on the expression of MIC. Here's the MIC gene. Here is that little stimulator, which could be activated. Oh, I can't see that. The, the blue is an inactive regulator because this protein called RB is binding to it and is preventing it from acting. One of the things that the chain of phosphorylations does is to come to the, the RB protein, phosphorylate it, and remember the charges can change the shape of the protein. It now no longer binds well to the little regulator of MIC gene expression. Another phosphorylation event can occur that activates that and MIC gets expressed. 
So if RB is there, we're going to prevent the phosphorylation of that activator. We've got a negative control on the cell going into division. So we can now identify two kinds of changes that could lead to cancer. If the EGF receptor were always sending signals, the cell will be driven into S base, that is, duplicate its DNA. Too often, this would be a cancer causing an oncogenic change as a result of a gain in function. If RB were inactivated, then the MIC protein could be made even when there were no stimulation for it to do so, because we've lost that negative regulator on gene expression. This would be a carcinogenic loss of function. These two kinds of changes are critical for the kinds of events that occur to lead cells to misbehave. So to put some nuts and bolts on this, let's take some specific examples. This is an example of a gain of function change in the EGF receptor. It has lost its extracellular domains. And remarkably, now when it cannot bind the growth factor, those two subunits always stick together. So the intracellular domains are always phosphorylating each other. So it's always sending a signal regardless of the concentration of epidermal growth factor. This is a gain of function change. And this is actually something that is leading to cancer in several cases. So this is a specific real example. We saw that when we had cadherin, being expressed in cells and giving rise to bonds between neighboring cells, that when they reached confluence, there was then contact inhibition of growth. But imagine if cadherin were defective, either because it wasn't made or it was made in a barren form. Either of those changes would lead to a loss of function. And now the cells would not adhere properly, would not signal properly, and would give rise to the kind of overgrowth shown on the right side. What can change the behavior of a protein? Well, remember that the protein structure is defined by its amino acid sequence. That structure leads to the way in which the protein folds up to form the little blob that's on the right. The structure of the protein is the chain of amino acids. If something changes the chain of amino acids, the protein will fold to a different shape. The gene is what is responsible for the sequence of amino acids in a protein. So if you change a gene, you change the structure of the resulting protein and will change its function. Changes in genes are called mutations. And so mutations now come to the fore as a significant element in how cells can be led to misbehave through the modification of their key proteins thanks to modifications of the genes that encode their amino acid sequence. Mutations, changes in the DNA structure, and there are many kinds, and this not being a molecular biology course, we'll limit ourselves to a few. A deletion removes some of the DNA, so only part or none of the protein is made. And I gave you an example of a deletion mutation in which the DNA encoding the extracellular domain of the EGF receptor was missing. That could have been a result of the loss of the relevant DNA. So when the protein was made, it was made without those amino acids. You can mutate a gene so that you change the level of gene expression. Remember the diagram where over here on the left, you were seeing a region that was involved in control of expression. If that is modified by changes in the bases or their position, sorry, the, the nucleotides, then you would have a change that might alter the extent of expression, either to raise it or lower it. So you could get a gain of function by having more of the protein or a loss of function by having less. In addition, changes of one or a few nucleotides can lead to altering what amino acid is put in place. And if, for example, you were supposed to have a positively charged amino acid here, but instead, you put in a negatively charged amino acid because that's what the RNA molecule told you to do, you would now make a protein with a different shape, a different structure, and therefore a different function. 
These are examples of DNA changes that can give rise to changes in protein function. It's important to recognize, though, that only rare mutations are carcinogenic. We can imagine, for example, a deletion mutation that takes out part of the protein that's involved in replicating DNA. If you can't replicate DNA, you can't reproduce. And so those cells won't be carcinogenic. They simply will never grow and divide. You can imagine a gene mutation that will take out, say, the transporters that bring sugars into the cell. Now the cell can't feed. The cell will run out of energy and die. The death of the cell sounds like a big event, but you do happen to have several trillion cells in your body, and you can spare one with great ease. So the death of individual cells is really immaterial. However, if a cell divides too often, it's a difficult matter. So the mutations that cause cancer are those that alter cell behavior in specific ways. There are names for cancer-inducing genes. You probably heard the term oncogene. This is a gene whose gain of function has given the property that it now is driving the cell into division, like that EGF receptor mutant that lost its extracellular domain. That was an oncogenic mutation and it made an oncogene. Genes that are slowing cell division are called tumor suppressors. And in this case, it is the loss of the gene, a loss of function mutation that will be carcinogenic. Now these aberrant genetic states are induced by things that alter DNA and factors that change DNA are called mutagens. What are the mutagens that increase cancer incidence? Some chemicals bind to DNA and cause DNA replication to make mistakes. That is to say that if a cell goes into S phase in the presence of one of these chemicals, as a result of the chemical in there, it jams the works when DNA is being prepared or replicated, and the result is two strands that are no longer the same. A change has been made, that's a mutation. What are these chemicals? Well, cigarette smoke has about 35 of them in it, and there are lots of them. And if you're interested, you can just Google mutagens, chemical mutagens, and you'll find lists of hundreds of chemicals. Um, uh, I could go on and on about that, but I'm not going to. Uh, that's, it's an interesting subject and a big one. Um, there's a lot of scare associated with the idea that if you don't eat organic foods, you're going to be taking in mutagens and, and leaving yourself on the road to hell. Uh, in my opinion, that's very unlikely. Other mutagens include energetic radiation, like X-rays gamma rays, which are a form of radioactivity, cosmic rays. So if you fly in an airplane and are exposing yourself to cosmic rays more than when you're on the surface of the Earth, that radiation is mutagenic. Some viruses are mutagenic, not cold viruses, not COVID, but human papillomavirus, for example, which is a sexually transmitted disease and is now known to be responsible for many of the cases of both cervical and penile cancer. So young people now are inoculated against this virus and is doing a great job of limiting those cancers. These viruses, oddly enough, actually carry oncogenes in their genome. And they do this because when they stimulate the cells they infect to divide, it makes more virus. So it's a very nice way in which this virus can benefit from modifying the host cell by turning it into a cancer cell. A few bacteria are carcinogenic, um, ones that are involved in bladder cancer and stomach cancer for as examples. So you can minimize your cancer risk by minimizing your exposure to carcinogens. However, oh, sorry, no. Um, an organism can protect itself from these mutating cells in a number of ways. There are mechanisms for DNA repair, for example. A checkpoint can hold up the cell cycle and allow DNA repair to take place. And the most important of these checkpoints is a protein called P53, where P stands for protein, 53 is its molecular weight in thousands of molecular weight units. P53 
regulates the cell cycle by turning on the synthesis. It's a gene regulator, and it turns on the synthesis of a protein that blocks the cell cycle right here. The cell can't go into mitosis. So it can't divide the chromosomes it's got, and it leaves time for the DNA repair process to occur. But sometimes repair can't happen. And if the damage cannot be repaired, M53 changes the genes that it turns on. And it turns on a remarkable process, which is basically cell suicide. And I'm going to show you a movie of this. P53 is turning on this process now in which a cell with a normal nucleus and a normal cytoplasm over the course of a matter of about an hour will simply take itself apart. The process involves the activation of proteins that cut up other proteins, proteins that cut up RNA, proteins that cut up DNA, proteins that cut up fats, so that the cell is taking itself apart. It makes itself into a bit of garbage, which is then taken up by other cells and used as food. This kind of process is very important in much of your life because it turns out in embryonic life, when your hand is being made, it isn't that you make projections that grow to get the fingers. You have a paddle and the cells in between your fingers induce this cell death process in order to get out of the way and give you the digits that you enjoy as an adult. So cell death is a regulated process which is very normal. Cell death is an important process in protection against viruses, because when a cell is virus infected, it will often turn on P53, activate cell death, and commit suicide so that the viruses get killed along with all the rest of the cell. It is also very important in cancer as a result of P53's ability to detect DNA damage and use that as a signal to turn on cell death. Another important defense against cancer is that cells that have become mutant are now different from normal cells. Not very different, but a little different. And those differences should be recognizable by our immune system because they're no longer true self. And indeed, this happens to protect us against the development of cancer. And here's an example of a small blood cell called a natural killer cell, which is recognized antibodies bound to the surface of a leukemia cell. And the leukemia cell now is turned on the natural killer cell to secrete into this cell those proteases that turn on cell suicide. And so the leukemia cell kills itself as a response to the natural killer cell, which is working through the immune system. Great. But the trouble is cancer cells can mutate to block this process. Once mutations get going, they can begin to go faster and faster. And this means that cancers can subvert all of these basic processes that your body naturally has to prevent itself from succumbing to cancer. Uh, this means then that the immune defense is suppressed and the cancer can persist. So just a couple of slides and I'm gonna show you what that sort of thing looks like. Here is a normal epithelium. It's the epithelium that coats the cervix. Oops, sorry. And oh, I'm, I'm using the pointer here again. On the left, the next in from the left is the beginning of excess cell division. And you can see this from the darkly staining cells, which have not begun to develop as they should develop to become normal skin. In the next panel over to the right, those kind of abnormal cells that are dividing too frequently and failing to so-called differentiate properly to make true skin are really overriding the whole preparation. But they're still local. This sort of thing can be called cancer in situ, meaning that all the cells you don't want are in one place. And at this stage, cancer is readily treated. But if cancer develops the ability to migrate, then you can be in trouble. And the migration involves loss of attachment to your neighbors, increase in cell motility, and the secretion of proteins that will degrade the fibrous layers that protect an epithelium from the underlying connective tissue. So now the cells can invade the connective tissue, get into blood vessels, and travel around. Now, not all 
cases of overgrowth are cancer. This is an example of a very benign growth, which I certainly have several of, and many of you may as well. This is just a small step along the way to cancer, and these are benign and generally of no danger at all. However, if you have a cell on the left that goes through one mutation that leads it to divide too often, you now get a little structure often called neoplasm, where there are too many cells and they're near where they don't belong. And then if another change occurs and they become migratory, now those cells will begin to wander around. And if additional changes occur, which allow them, say, to secrete those enzymes that will degrade the fibrous barriers and let them get out of their epithelium where they started and into blood vessels, now you're in a dangerous situation because this cancer can so-called metastasize and take up growth sites elsewhere. It's multiple changes that bring this about. So how can an individual cell accumulate so many mutations that it misbehaves in all these ways? With every round of DNA synthesis, a few mutations are introduced. And the reason for this is that um, although DNA synthesis is very accurate, it's not perfect. Um, about 60 mutations are made every time a cell divides. And there's so many bases, there are about 6 billion bases, which means that 60 and 6 million in 6 billion is a very small number. And these changes seem to occur in random places. So the majority of those mutations have absolutely no consequence at all. However, the rate of mutation is increased by mutagens. And early mutation, if it reduces, say, the fidelity of DNA replication, the cell will then make mistakes more frequently with every cell cycle. And if the different mutations reduce the fidelity of mitosis, then chromosomes will be lost or gained with every mitosis. These kinds of mutations are called mutator mutations. For example, if you were to get a loss of function mutation in a DNA repair enzyme, more mutations would show through because you weren't able to fix them. If you can't align your chromosomes properly on the mitotic spindle, you can get a situation like this. On the left is a normal complement of human chromosomes, two of every kind, one for mom, one for dad, and they're covered with a special dyeing process that defines each chromosome in a different color. On your right is the same sort of diagram from a fairly advanced cancer. And you can see what a mess this genome has become as a result of excess duplication, chromosomes being gained and lost, and even switched around. This kind of genetic instability is the hallmark of cells that are changing rapidly and are therefore going to be able to develop loss of function of all of the growth inhibitors and gain of function of things like of the uh, growth factors and growth factor receptors. And so cancer really is a cascade of mutations that can lead to dangerous cell behavior. A single mutation giving rise to multiplication and then another chance of changes that allows it to be somewhat different again and another set of changes Many of these changes may actually be lethal mutations, because as I've said, not all mutations are carcinogenic. Many are irrelevant, but some would cause these cells to die. And yet what this has become is a population of cells that although it was derived from your cells, it's no longer you. It is a pathogen. And it is now a pathogen in a position to evolve in order to be well adapted to the environment, which is you. And you now are the host for a pathogen of your own making, which could go in and end up real trauma. And it is because of this sequence of mutations that cancer is far more common in the elderly people than in the young. Here is the incidence of growth per 100,000 people as a function of the age of the people. And you can see that around about my age up here, it becomes a rather likely event. And so, Cancer is a natural phenomenon. It's a result of failure in accuracy of DNA replication. And it gives rise to an organism that then evolves for its own benefit, not yours. You are the host for an organism, and the organism is going to do what it can. And this misbehavior is not due to invention of new behaviors. It's simply loss of control leading to 
development and, uh, and division where it should not occur, migration where it should not occur. All these changes are natural events. So cancer really is a mutation-induced loss of normal control. So we can define several sort of hallmarks of what cancer is to conclude. Cells grow and divide when they should not. They migrate from where they do belong to where they do not. They lose their ability to commit suicide. They block the killing action of the immune system. And something I haven't treated is that they become able to stimulate the growth of blood vessels, which is very important for tumors because the cells in the middle of a tumor become starved for oxygen and food. And they can solve that problem by bringing in vasculature. And that's what allows tumors to grow. To do all this within the brief period of one human lifetime, cells must become genetically unstable so it can acquire all of the necessary mutations in the right time. Cancer cells evolve to suit their own best interests, not yours. And once a cell is genetically unstable, it can change with each cell cycle. So finding effective treatments is a major challenge. Thank you. Any questions? Absolutely wonderful. Um, it's sort of scary that we still, <laughs> we still live beyond 10 years or something like that, as long as we avoid uh, cigarette smoking. <laughs> So we have two sources of questions. We have questions from the, uh, the, uh, the, for the uh, online audience and questions from you folks. We're gonna alternate them. Do you have any questions? Yes. And just a comment on cell phones. You're probably correct. There's no direct link, but there are, I think, highly likely to be some indirect links. I'm sorry, I missed what you, you said cell poles? Cell poles, cell phones and Wi-Fi, radio fields. Oh, cell phones, right. And I can show you data on that. It's pretty strong. Okay. So I would worry about that as not direct cause in the same way as in high energy radiation where you break bonds, but in modifying the radical pair process. Thank you. So we'd like to go to a question from the, from the radio audience. This is a pre-submitted question. Does a plant-based diet have any role in preventing cancer? You probably know Dr. Furman's claims that it does. Does a plant cell diet have any role in preventing cancer? And the answer seems to be yes, which sounds surprising. And yet one of the uh, forms of chemistry in our cells that is responsible for modifying DNA and inducing mutations is processes that involve a kind of chemical called a free radical. And free radicals are generated in our body all the time by metabolism. And our body, our, every cell has a whole group of mechanisms to suppress those chemicals and make it so they don't damage anything. Plants also have mechanisms that can suppress free radicals. If we eat meat, we're eating the same kind of mechanisms that we own already. If we eat plants, we may be acquiring different kinds of chemistry for combating this kind of mutagenic activity. That's my interpretation of why a plant diet does seem to be better. And indeed, the evidence is vegetarians get cancer less frequently than others. But the trouble is vegetarians may do other things that are good too, like not smoke, not drink. <laughs> Yes, that's encouraging. <laughs> so an another question from audience. Yes, Alan. If a lifespan were sufficiently long, would cancer be inevitable? Um, a good question. And I think inevitable is too strong, but it would become ever more likely, as indicated by the very steep curve that I showed. The interesting thing here is we all know people or who have smoked a pack a day and don't get cancer, whereas somebody else who leads a clean, wonderful life succumbs at an early age. What can this be? And the way in which I interpret it is, you know that there is tremendous variation in our ability to do things like throw a baseball, uh, climb a mountain, 
calculate a, a complex sum or solve a differential equation. These differences are just differences in who we are, but they're all based on chemistry and how good are your enzymes at doing stuff. Some people probably have enzymes that are extremely good at eliminating the free radicals, at repairing DNA. And so they can withstand all kinds of challenges because their enzymes are just super protecting them. Others of us have less effective enzymes, just as I you know, have a terrible memory. <laughs> so um, uh, I think it's that kind of variation. Um, but on average, the longer you live, the more likely you are to get cancer. We have another question from the from the online audience. Are there notable cellular differences between pediatric and adult cancers, aggressiveness, tumor formulations, and interrupters? <laughs> are, you, you are there notable cellular differences between pediatric and adult cancers, aggressiveness, tumor formulation, and interrupters? I can't answer that question in detail, but I can make a few comments that are relevant. And the example that I'm going to turn to for my information is um, pediatric blood cancers like leukemia compared with leukemia when it emerges later in life. Um, the first or almost the first real successes in curing serious cancers were with childhood leukemias. And it was achieved by means of finding a whole collection of poisons that they just poured on these poor kids. And they were inhibitors of DNA synthesis and inhibitors of cell division. And the kids were terribly sick for a month or so. But they recovered. And when they recovered, they really recovered. And there were cures as a result of this. Whereas the same treatments applied to adults never achieved the same degree of cure. And my opinion for the reason of this is that the young people had many fewer mutations throughout their genome. They had a few mutations which had brought on the cancer, and those cells were killed by the treatments. But the other mutations which might have made them become more resistant to the treatments or caused another cancer to grow up weren't there yet because they were young. So their youth meant that their DNA was in better shape, fewer mutations accumulated, and so they responded better to treatment. So we, we have, uh, let me explain what's going on. We have 40 people who are attending this online, and we have uh, 15 people here. So uh, we, we want to make sure we have a balance of questions. But we have another question from, yes. I mentioned that our immune system can actually identify cancer cells and kill them. And I mentioned that the cancer involves ways of defeating that killing. And one way, which I didn't talk about in any detail, is that Cancer cells can develop the ability not to transport proteins to their surface. So the fact they have mutant proteins inside them is invisible. And that's one of the tricks that cancer cells can use. But the more common trick that they use is they mutate to produce proteins that block the normal interaction between cells and killer cells from the immune system. The interaction between immune cells like T cells and other cells is a complicated thing that involves the interaction of something like 15 cell surface proteins on each side linking up and sending signals from one cell to the other. And what cancer cells can do is put on their surface proteins that block that interaction so the killer cell can't kill. Now you can ask, how do they do this? Remember that they are mutating like mad and they're producing all kinds of different proteins all the time as a result of their changes. Many of those changes are leading cancer cells to die. So we just don't know about it, they are gone. But by chance, one of those cells is gonna come up with a surface protein that blocks the interaction with the immune cell. So now that cancer cell is immortal as far as immune killing is concerned. The immune therapies work by 
identifying what those interactions are and making antibodies that will bind to the cancer cell and block the blockage. So you inhibit the inhibition, and through that, you now allow the T cells to come and kill the cancer cells. And in some cases, it's working very well. Um, the difficulty is that whenever you fiddle with the immune system, you run up against the problem that your immune system has an extremely difficult problem. That is, it's supposed to be able to recognize any pathogen that comes along, but never turn on itself and start killing your own cells. And we know there are autoimmune diseases like lupus, and those are diseases where your immune system is turning on yourself. The immune system has a large number of suppressive elements, and cancer is taking advantage of those suppressor elements. And if you now knock out the suppressor elements with your treatment, you may induce an autoimmune disease. And so the treatments are complex, but they are remarkably encouraging, and they'll presumably get better as we understand the problem. We have another question from the online. There are many stages of cancer. Which yeah, stage? There are many stages of cancer. Which stage would you say is too late to treat? <laughs> um, well, it's never too late to treat, so it's a question of how effective the treatment is going to be. Um, and uh, the dogma in the field is the earlier the treatment, the more effective and the better it will be. Um, this is measured by oncologists in terms of how long does a patient live after I begin my treatment. And five years of uh, being cancer-free is regarded as a cure by many. And if you catch the cancer earlier and start treating earlier, you're much more likely to get to that five-year survival. And so there's a little bit of a sleight of hand in the statement that early treatments are much more effective. But they are because if you catch a cell early, it has not gone through this extensive accumulated accumulation of mutations. So it may not, for example, have yet developed the ability to silence the immune system. And so if you can just do something to stop the cancer's growth, the immune system may come in and clear it out. Um, so uh, I can't give a, a boundary, um, uh, which seems to be what the question is asking for. The general rule of thumb is the sooner the better. And clearly if a cancer cell has begun to metastasize, the problem is significantly greater because it's no longer in one place where you can treat it by either surgery or radiation in a convenient way. Once a cancer is widespread, your only possible therapies are chemotherapies, none of which is really very satisfactory. So I should introduce our interlocutor with his very skillful <laughs> translation of uh, questions. Uh, yes. Uh, a question you mentioned T cells. And I've heard that T cells are used in uh, modification of T cells are used in treatment of cancer. Can you explain how that works? Yeah. Um, so T cell, T, T stands for one kind of white blood cell. And there are several kinds of T cells, which is one of the reasons this begins to get complicated. There is a kind called the killer T cell. There's another kind called a regulatory T cell, and there's another kind called a suppressor, a helper T cell. Um, and they all do different things during the course of an immune reaction. What one is trying to get in the case of cancer is killer T cells that recognize the cancer as non-self and will therefore inject into those cells these little enzymes that will go ahead and cause the cells to commit suicide and clear out the tumor. And it really works. It's marvelous. But they are the ones whose interaction with cells is blocked by the cancer. Um, so um, the evidence for this is that it turns out that if you just take a tumor from someone who has a very good tumor mask, there are T cells in it, but they're not killing the tumor cells, whereas they should be. And why they're not probably has to do with these elements of immune suppression. Um, the problem then is somehow 
overcoming this suppression. And it can happen spontaneously, remarkably. There are cases where people have been given up as a total lost cause because they have tumors all over their body. And six months later, they're fine and come back and get worked up to completion and all the cancer is gone. And this is almost certainly a case where somehow the immune system overcame the cancer's suppression, went to town and just took out the whole cancer. And that's the kind of thing we would like to develop in immune therapies, but we're nowhere near there because the cancer cells not only talk to one another by adjacent attachments, there is a whole series of chemicals called interleukins, which are soluble molecules that are a little like growth factors that go around and give information to different T cells about what other cells in the immune system are doing. Immunology is becoming one of the most complicated of all branches of biology. It's almost as bad as neuroscience. Uh, so uh, progress is being made, but that's the best I can do. And so I did get a chance to, this is Brian Bishop. Um, so another question. Yes. Are there any high impact areas that reduce the risk of cancer for kids, teens, adults, older adults? either separately by age or altogether? High impact areas. I wish I understood what area meant. I mean, the area, the things that reduce cancer risk is avoiding carcinogens. That's something that we could do. But the problem is you're dealt the genes that your parents gave you. And this can include genes that will promote cancer. You probably all know cancer runs in families. And the reason this is possible is that the genes that encode tumor suppressors can be present in your body in one good copy that works and another copy that doesn't work, a completely defective. And now if you imagine only one mutation is necessary completely to remove that function. And that is the mechanism of inheritance of likelihood of cancer. Uh, that's nothing you could do anything about. Domains that would reduce cancer risk, all I can think of really is reducing your exposure to carcinogens. And what you can see really is that there's a lot of luck in this. Born with genes that include good DNA repair enzymes and so forth. Or when these naturally occurring mutations occurred, did you happen to get a mutation in a key enzyme like a DNA repair enzyme? Or was it with left field someplace? Oncologists hate the idea that cancer is dependent upon luck. And they've told me very dramatically that you cannot tell a cancer patient that. But my opinion is you must tell a cancer patient that because that's true. Do we have, yes. One, one sort of therapy for a, for a number of these diseases are kinase inhibitors. And sometimes they're very specific to a particular target or tissue that they're used for. Why, why are they not generally available, generally effective? Well, um, each cell in our body has the genes for and in general banks, something like 500 different kinases. So kinase is a very general term and kinases are used to regulate zillions of processes in cells to use a technical term. Um, those that control growth are a specific subset, like the receptor kinases that I was talking about, and a few others that are beneath the receptor kinases in that little cascade that worked towards the control of the gene. And I should add, that control process is actually extremely complicated, and I didn't go into that, but there are branches and bifurcations and so forth, and many kinases along the way. So you want to inhibit the kinases that are important for cell growth. And that's a subset of the kinases. And that's what they tried to do in the kinase inhibitors that they use as chemotherapies. The problem is that they're necessary for the normal growth in your intestine and your skin and all these other things. So like other chemotherapies, they're not totally benign, but they're much less damaging than things like poisons for DNA synthesis. So Brian, do you have any more questions? This is the last one in the Q&A. 
Is it possible to know what type of mutation has occurred so that CRISPR could be injected directly into the tumor to correct the mutation or kill the cancer cells? I, I knew we'd hear about that. <laughs> it, it's a great question. And of course, it's the kind of thing that um, energetic oncologists are thinking about. And the answer is yes, it is possible to know what mutations have occurred. And indeed, the cost of DNA sequencing has now come down so far that it's only about $5,000 to do most of the human genome. And this means that under cases where the diagnostician really doesn't know what are the key mutations that are so-called driving the cancer, they may do a human genome sequence and from that learn which genes have been mutated and are probably responsible for each of the different aspects of cancer cell behavior. More refined than that, there are a number of genes, famous tumor suppressors, for example, which are known to be likely to be mutated in order to allow a particular kind of cancer to go forward. One of the best examples are the genes discovered by Mary Claire King for breast cancer, BRCA1 and 2. And these are tumor suppressant genes. And so the mutations that inactivate them are well known and they've been characterized in many cases. And so if either a woman is concerned that she may be carrying a mutant allele for this and therefore be uh, inclined to have cancer, they can simply sequence that portion of the genome for 100 bucks. And you can thereby know whether you are at risk for breast cancer as a result of the mutation you're carrying. Now, um, that same thing can be said for each of the known cancer genes, both the tumor suppressors and the tumor promoters. Um, using CRISPR is something that has a lot of charm and a lot of danger, in my opinion. And the reason it's difficult is that in order for CRISPR to work, you have to get the DNA that you want to encode the CRISPR machinery into the cells that you want to modify. And you don't really want to modify all the other cells of the body. And so how do you target the DNA which is going to be able to go into the cells which are damaged? Turn on synthesis of the Cas9 enzyme, which is what's going to do the modification, make the little guide RNA that you want in order to have it go into place and modify only the genes you want in only the cells you want to change. And that's a problem which, to my knowledge, has not been solved. Though people are now doing this of injecting those molecular reagents into tumors and seeing in um, experiments whether they can actually induce cell death in that way. Um, a problem is that by the time a cancer is large enough to be noticed, um, uh, it, it's many cells. Uh, a, a millimeter the size of a pinhead has about a million cells in it. And if those million cells have all grown from one cancer cell that developed that first mutation and they divide two many times, that's, uh, I can't do the arithmetic in my head, but it's like 20 divisions. And that's 20 chances to make mistakes, which means that that cell, that cluster of cells probably already has several mutations in it. Which ones are important? Which ones are you going to correct? It's a very complicated problem. And so I think it's the kind of thing where um, oncologists who have a tremendous amount of courage and self-confidence may do experiments of questionable taste. So, so Brian, you are a uh, you have some ask some very intelligent questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, do we have more questions in here? You mentioned that uh, exposure to high energy particles is a, a danger for this particular issue. Is there any evidence among airline pilots and military pilots that their risk of cancer is larger than normal? Good question. I don't know the answer. My guess is not. I think it takes more exposure than they would get. But uh, one of the things that oncologists who do radiology like to talk about is that a chest x-ray is supposed to give you no more exposure to ionizing radiation than a flight from um, New York to San Francisco. And I don't know whether that's true, because I know that they like to minimize the potential danger of their x-rays. 
Um, the, the reason we know about ionizing radiation being extremely dangerous really comes mostly from the studies of people around the atomic energy bombs in Japan that we visited upon our enemies. Because uh, although people who were not killed but lived in the periphery, first of all, showed very high incidences of leukemia. And then some 10 years later, very high incidences of uh, carcinomic cancers of epithelium. And it was the first absolutely unequivocal, huge population studies that showed radiation causes cancer. Um, and then subsequently, that's been refined and studied in, in great detail. But that's, of course, very strong ionizing radiation. How about astronauts or people who were in the space station? It's a good question. And the answer probably is their cancer risk is increased. They're probably very healthy people to have gotten into that position in the first place. So it may not show up in a hurry. Indeed, the interval of time between exposure to a carcinogen and the development of a solid cancer like a carcinoma is usually 25 years. And so it'll take a while before the data are available. And we do, unfortunately, have evidence from the early years of Los Alamos of uh, people developing long-term cancer. Well, and actually, the, one of the men who was very active with x-rays early on was Thomas Edison. Mm -hmm. And Edison built x-ray tubes that were generated. And he built a little fluoroscope that would allow you to visualize this. And he had a technician who he got to do all the work. And the technician showed people the bones of their hands and the feet and so forth. And that technician died of cancer. Mm -hmm. as a result. So we have one more question from the... That somewhat answered it. The last question was, does imaging to detect cancer risk creating cancer causing mutations? Does imaging to detect cancer increase cancer risk? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and, and it's a real problem because um, if you have something like a, a metastatic cancer that is dispersed, the only really good imaging method to see it is this technique called positron emission tomography where you administer a radioisotope attached to a sugar that the cells will take in. And it's a sugar that doesn't get metabolized properly so that your cancer cells accumulate this thing and they're then emitting gamma rays all over the place. And you can detect that, but it means that the body is for a while exposed to fairly intense gamma irradiation and it's not good. The question is, what are you gonna to do to detect the cancer except look at it with x-rays? And so the doctors very reasonably think it's a cost-benefit situation and the benefits outweigh the risks. I remember the days when, when you went to a shoe store, you stuck your foot That's into right. it. You could see whether the shoe fit or not. That's right. And the, you don't see those anymore, do you? <laughs> well, thank you for your interest. Well, thank you very much.